I'm Amanda Masters, co-founder, owner, and CEO of Awake TV Network. Check out awaketvnetwork.live, our conscious media platform here to support you during this massive global awakening experience. We have tons of content, classes, and seasons with show hosts that are here to support you during these times. Enjoy the episode. Hello, I'm Jennifer Hill, your host here at Awake TV Network. And I'm so excited to have you here with us for episode eight, Constructing the Past and Future Now and Navigating Time Travel with Dr. Deepak Chopra and Professor Don Hoffman. Dr. Deepak Chopra is founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity focused on research for humanitarianism and well being, as well as Chopra Global, a medical organization at the intersection of science and spirituality. Dr. Deepak Chopra is a pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. He has authored 90 books, with his 90th book, MetaHuman, coming out earlier this year, and his 91st book about to be released in September. Additionally, we have Professor Don Hoffman. Don received his PhD from MIT and is currently a professor emeritus at the University of California, Irvine in Cognitive Sciences. He has authored over 120 scientific research papers and three books, including The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another conversation at the intersection of cutting-edge science and spirituality. I'm your host, Jennifer Hill, and we have with us today Dr. Deepak Chopra and Don Hoffman. Uh, gosh, <laughs> so many places to go. Love is the answer to everything. Deepak offered a potential new formula on consciousness in the universe in the last episode, just to catch everybody up. And of course, Don and I were talking offline about scattering amplitudes and how he's working on creating a theory based on scattering amplitudes, which we're very excited when he comes out with that. I think one of the things that we wanted to talk about in the last, the end of the last episode is we started to touch on the idea of black holes and white holes. And Don, I know in your book, The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes, you touch on in chapter six, a really great example of a quasar. And I believe it was Wheeler you gave in the example. Could you illuminate our audience a little bit on black holes, white holes, and a little bit about some of the probabilities that it involves with respect to how we perceive the universe? Yeah, so with quasars, um, these are very powerful objects in space, usually powered by black holes, always powered by black holes. They're the only thing powerful enough to do this, we suspect. And as they um, feed on their accretion disk, all this matter that's coming into them, they send out these incredible jets of energy that are so powerful, you can see them billions of light years away across the universe. And uh, so the light from those then can be traveling for billions of years before we see it. And did you want to talk about the Wheeler kind of experiment on that? Well, I loved what you shared in the book. It was funny. And I had read your book a while ago, and I really wanted to find that section in it because I love what you talk about, about time travel. It's funny because one of our audience members in a prior episode, I always try to read the comments, said, well, based on everything you're talking about, is time travel possible? And I think you addressed just that point with Wheeler and his theory of what we're looking for and how the photons move. Right. So... So this was a, a brilliant idea from, from Wheeler. Um, and what, what, what he proposed was what's called a delayed choice experiment. So in, in quantum theory, you can choose whether to measure, for example, um, which slit a photon goes through. So you might have two slits, A and B, and you can choose to measure A or whether it went through A or B. Or you can choose not to. You can allow yourself to um, just open up both slits and measure an interference pattern mm. instead. And what Wheeler proposed was we could, he wanted to make the point that in some sense is what we choose to measure that determines what we can say about the whole history of the past. 
And he, he proposed, look, suppose there's a photon that's left a quasar, and as it's coming toward us, it had, the, the photons run into uh, a, a big massive galaxy which bends space. This is Einstein's theory that you could bend space with mass that's big enough. Well, any mass will do it, but you need a big mass for, for, for Wheeler's experiment. If so, then the light could literally go, some light could go one way or it could go the other way, mm -hmm. or a superposition. Quantum yeah. mechanics allows a superposition. So it's like a lens. So space, because it curves, is just like a lens. And so you can actually, in many cases, get double images. You look into space, you can see two images of the quasar behind a galaxy. And it's, it's, it's an optical illusion due to the bending of space, which is really quite, quite striking. So what, what Wheeler proposed was, look, suppose that I, right now, choose to measure if, whether the the light came from the left side of the galaxy or the right side of the galaxy that's bending, you know, that's bending the light, right? Or I could choose to not do that just to measure an interference pattern. He said, so suppose I choose to measure which side and it turns out to be on the left. Well, that means that I would now say that for the last several billion years, that photon has been going on the left. Of the of the galaxy, so I'm I'm telling you a story now that's been going on for for billions of years. But if I'd chosen otherwise, I wouldn't be able to say that. I would say I, I would say that it's not true that it went to the left side or the right side. It was in a superposition, so it's not true that it went left or right. So what I'm saying about the last several billion years of history of the of the travel of this photon depends on what I choose now. And so the point is that there's that we as the observers, the, partici the participators, you know, he liked to talk about us, our participation in this, in this thing. In some sense, we're creating the past by the measurements we make in the present, which for most of us is highly counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive because we always, at the back of our minds, are thinking about space time as the pre existing reality. And mm -hmm. so it's the final reality. And it's what's real, and we're just little, little guys, little women, little players inside this big, big pre-existing stage. And what, what Wheeler's experiment is doing is saying we need to change that around. You, as the observer participator, are determining the history by your measurements. Now, you're the you're creating everything that you see. So it's all these observer participator interactions, Wheeler thought that were somehow, he didn't know how, but somehow they were creating the reality. Incredible. Deepak, I would love to know your take on how this is viewed in a spiritual standpoint and if time travel from your perspective is possible spiritually. Yeah, so uh, you know, the way I think of it, First of all, thank you very much, uh, John, for that very exquisite and beautiful explanation of uh, delayed choice uh, experiments. All my life, I've been a fan of uh, John Wheeler. I even went to Princeton once to see, uh, you know, where Einstein lived, and you know, there are lots of these wonderful conversations between Einstein and John. Wheeler as well, and the most important thing I've taken away from John Wheeler is uh, the expression that you used, participatory universe, that we participate. Deepak, I'm going to pause you for one moment, my friend. Uh, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. It's quiet, and I love what you were just saying about the participatory universe. So maybe if you could just lean into the camera a little bit or to the microphone, yeah. then that would, I think, help us be able to hear you more clearly. It's the volume, too. Let me do that. Thank you. Volume. We don't want to miss your pearls of wisdom. So can you hear me well now? Fantastic. Perfect. Thank you. John Wheeler uh, used that phrase, participatory universe. And of course, he was a colleague of Einstein. And as we all know, he just passed away only recently in his 90s. He was very lucid, very clear thinker, and in many ways, a revolutionary thinker. So I'll take uh, what, uh, what uh, Don said. And before, you know, we keep saying from a scientific perspective, from a spiritual perspective. So I want to be a little clear on what we mean by that, okay? The scientific perspective looks at the world independently 
uh, of the observer. At least that's the supposition that there is an observer independent universe. Um, but of course, that's also being questioned now uh, with all that uh, Don is saying, and that has been questioned um, right from the beginning with the Copenhagen interpretation and the John von Neumann interpretation of the Copenhagen interpretation, all of that. But leave aside all that, leave aside right now all of that and just stick with one thing that uh, Don said. And for practical purposes, practical purposes, let's say science is about what's there, what's there, okay? And spirituality is about who is asking the question or what is asking the question. I would like to just stick with those very simple um, definitions, okay? Science is saying, What's there? How does it occur? What's the mechanism? Figure it out, etc. And then spirituality says, who's asking the question? And the simplest answer is, I am asking the question. In this case, I'm a scientist, or I'm a philosopher, or I'm a religious, or I'm a theologian, or I'm a practor, practitioner of meditation. But I am asking the question. I am asking the question. Now we know from uh, what Don has said, based on our previous conversations, that observation is not merely observation, it's construction, okay? So once we just say that every observation is a construction, then in every experience of the universe, whatever that is, however we define it, in every experience of the universe, we are constructing that experience of the universe right now. We are constructing the experience of the universe. And furthermore, we are constructing the human experience of the universe, not a butterfly experience of the universe, not a dolphin experience of the universe, not a bat experience of the universe, not a, a universe as experienced by a sentient being called an insect with the multiple eyes. Okay, I have no idea what that experience is. But in every observation of the universe that we make, I make, you make, as human beings, we construct the universe. And we construct the universe in consciousness, obviously. Where else could we construct it? You know, and the brain has a neural correlate, which is also an observation. So if we believe that the brain correlate is also an observation, which we must, because we see the brain correlates on through instruments on scans and this and that, and we make suppositions, then every experience, including the experience of the brain, the neural correlate, and the galaxies, and dark matter, and dark energy, and black holes, whatever we call is a construction right now. Okay, so based on the questions we ask and how we design the experiment, okay, how we design the experiment, the, the, the whole thing started with a simple experiment called the double split experiment. And now there are many versions of that. In fact, I have friends who are doing double split with the human eye. Okay, so you can actually, the human eye uh, can choose to see a wave or to see a particle. Um, there, there are many experiments going on that, that way also. Bottom line is, with the delay Joyce experiment, we now have a clue that we construct the past of the universe. Humans are construct humans, or by saying humans, human consciousness, whatever the means might be, which is very complicated actually, the experience, that's called the hard problem. If you assume the physicalist ontology, then it's unanswerable. Okay, it's unanswerable how atoms, molecules, and force fields give rise to thought, or gives rise to uh, a speculation, or gives rise to how we design an experiment, or how we give, uh, make an observation, or how we come up with a hypothesis. If we assume that atoms, molecules, and force fields create consciousness, we're stuck. <laughs> we're stuck. But if we go to where Don is saying that the I which in this case is consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I is also, I think, a human version of consciousness because consciousness has many versions. 
the human version of consciousness, which is I am, is simultaneously in every observation experiencing everything that we is perceptual. That means galaxies, universes, the constructs of dark matter, the constructs of dark energy, the constructs of black holes, all of that is constructed right now in our consciousness. So we construct the past of the universe, but now here's something else. If we construct the past of the universe, then this with this new knowledge that we have, that the I am, which is choosing to make the observation, is not only conceiving, constructing, governing, but becoming the experience of the universe. Once again, I am conceives, constructs, governs, and becomes the experience of the universe, including its past. But here's the beauty. If we can construct the past, we can construct the future of the universe too. And in fact, we are doing that now with VR and augmented reality and immersive dream experiences. The very <laughs> the very, and I'll finish very soon, the very fact that I can put a headset on and experience something scary and it raises my blood pressure and my heart rate and causes my heart to go into an arrhythmia and causes inflammation in the body, the very fact that VR can do it means that my biology is also part of the VR. My brain is also part of the VR as much as the galaxy. So I am is prior to space and time. Mm. I am is not in space and time. That leads to a huge conclusion, which means that my fundamental nature as a human being, actually the fundamental nature of all sentient beings, insects, bees, everything, fundamental nature is that as consciousness, they don't exist in space time. The body, <laughs> the body mind is a means of observation, the whole body mind. All our five senses are modes of observation. So I think of the body mind as another instrument to observe. And it observes something very unique. That is, it observes a human universe, but then it constructs the notion of a human universe. And it goes even further in that it can choose to construct the past and the future. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody else follow that out there? Because I'm going to have to hit rewind and go back just so that we can engage a little bit further, Deepak. That was very, very powerful. I, last comment is, uh, well, I, I like what you say that it resonates with you, but let's ask a scientist. And I have one question, though, because I do want to take it back to the original question about time travel. And what I heard you just say is that because we're doing the observing, we're creating the past, and thus we're creating the future, I wanted to run something by you on that. I had once heard of a spiritual principle that I'm curious if you know about, where you go back and you visualize something from your past that perhaps caused you pain or suffering, much like a virtual reality. And you reimagine that past incident turning out the way that you could have had it turn out in a different way that empowered you rather than something that disempowered you. And in doing so, that actually changes your future because of the fact that you're now rewriting the past, which is in alignment with what you were just saying. I'll answer that question, then we go to Don. Perfect. Okay. But it's not necessary to reimagine anything. It's not necessary. As long as you realize that you as consciousness are constructing the observation, then you also realize that you are independent of the observation. Got it. Okay, that you are independent. So you don't have to do anything, reimagine or anything. You are in charge of your constructions, period. And you assume that all constructions are virtual reality, including the construction that you call your brain and your body is also part of the virtual reality. You assume that, once you assume that, you're independent of the experience. So in the spiritual traditions that I come from, you're already independent of the experience because you're not in space-time, period. Got it. All right, Don, back to you. <laughs> and what was, the, what was the question that you'd like me to talk about? One more question, one more. Time travel. So from Don's point of view, time travel faster than the speed of light would be 
uh, warping of space time, uh, I think, or, you know, or something that would assume entanglement at some point, you know, non-local correlations as time travel. But from the point of view of consciousness, we're tra time traveling all the time. Every time you have a thought, you're time traveling. So to your point, Don, the question is, could we time travel and do we need to move out of space time in order to be able to time travel or could it exist within the space time construct? Well, we, we do know that there are certain kinds of time travel that, that modern science absolutely says will happen. So, so for example, if you have a twin, an identical twin, and they go in a rocket close to say a black hole, and get very, very, so when you get close to a gravitational field like the black hole, um, time slows down for you. Mm. But even here on Earth, if you're at the penthouse of a building versus the bottom floor, the people on the penthouse are aging faster than the people on the bottom floor. They're paying extra money to age at a faster rate. It's very <laughs> small. <laughs> on Earth, the gravitational field isn't very much, but you actually have a time travel effect even from the top floor and the bottom floor of, of, a, of a tall building. But okay. at a pole, it's, it's the warping of, of space-time is so strong that you could, um, if you see someone falling into a black hole, you will actually never see them fall into it because time will slow down so much. The time difference is so much that you'll just see them just slow, 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 slow down and eventually spread out, but you'll never, it's an infinite amount of time it'll take to see them fall into the black hole. So you can actually never see anybody fall into a black hole because of this time differential. So we, we know that, that Einstein's theory already predicts that kind of time travel um, that, that's quite remarkable. Now, there are, we, there are things in the universe that we know of right now that are moving away from us faster than the speed of light. Most galaxies that we're seeing are moving away from us faster than the speed of light. But the interesting thing is they're not moving through space faster than the speed of light from us. It's space itself that is expanding very, very quickly, faster than the speed of light. So in fact, because of this effect, 97% of all the galaxies that we can see are not reachable by any rocket that we currently can think of rockets that go through space. Now, if we could eventually get a technology, I mean, we're, what we're saying is that we're the authors of space. We're not stuck in space. If we really turn that idea into a mathematically precise statement, we should eventually be able to come up with technologies that let us play with space time. Mm -hmm. And we then may be able to do some very interesting travel um, maybe not so much through space-time as around space-time, which would be very, very interesting. It's very much like you know, a video game player. If you're a real whiz at a video game, you can do amazing things. Everybody's impressed with what you can do in the video game, but you're always moving through the imaginary space of the video game. But if you're the programmer and you know how that video game was put together, then you can play with the very parameters of the roads, the space in which the game is being played. If it's like an auto racing game, you can change how long the roads are. You can change the size of the cars. You can play with the very dimensions of the whole thing. So, I mean, what we're saying here is if we can turn this idea into hard-nosed science, we will be able to play with the parameters of space-time. That will be an incredible technology. Quick question on that uh, before we go to you, Deepak. I'm just curious for my own edification, Don. I remember I was sitting having dinner with a physicist one night and he explained to me, if I understood it right, that the way that time travel could theoretically exist would be you have time spa or space time on one side and space time on the other and that you fold it together and then you pass through from point A to point B. Am I getting that right? Am I recalling that correctly? Yeah, that would be more, it's not so much traveling through space that way, but 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 having a wormhole effectively. This that, is like, I, I, perhaps that's what I was referring to. I was trying to remember that. Yeah, so theoretically, in principle, space can bend. You could imagine space bending in such a way that, that you know, if you take a piece of paper, instead of going from one point to another on the paper, if you took the sides of the paper and touched them together, two points that were far away are now very, very close. Got it. Theoretically, there is a, a wormhole that, that, that could pass through and, and make the two in some sense connected. Right now, um, 
we don't have any notion of a technology and, and no notion that I know of from the physics about how someone the size of a human being could go <laughs> through such a wormhole. I mean, there, there are things about passing a particle through or some, you, know, you know, a quantum bit or something like that. Um, I'm not saying it can't be, and I'm just saying our current state, as far as I understand the current state of knowledge on this, or of course, something may have happened in the last couple of years, but the state of play until recently was that nothing the size of a human is, is conceivably going through one of those wormholes probably anytime soon. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> okay, that would be nice during COVID or during anything right now. So, Deepak, back to you. <laughs> okay, so, you know, Don just said something. We are the authors of space. So once you say that, you have to say we are the authors of time as well. You can't, you can't separate the two. If there's entanglement in space, there has to be entanglement in time as well. That, that's one comment. Yes. Second, uh, if you're interested, I can give you two metaphors. Please. That actually, as a, a good stories, one comes from Indian spirituality, and the other comes actually from Stephen Hawking. And uh, I'd like to give you these two metaphors right now that might explicate a little bit what Don was saying. So according to physics right now, according to current theories of black holes, there's something called an event horizon, which is, you know, so many kilometers supposedly from the center of the black hole or the singularity. And if a particle crosses the event horizon, then to an outside observer, uh, as uh, Don just said, it seems like that particle or whatever, let's assume human being, uh, is at the event horizon. To an outside observer, they, it seems like they're stuck there for eternity. They don't move. But to themselves, the particle, let's say the a particle is a sentient being, it crosses the event horizon, it moves as if it was moving the same way before. Time, the experience of time doesn't change for the, for the person or the particle that's crossing over. So based on this, you know, I once asked my spiritual guru, I said, you know, what happens to us when we cross the threshold of time? And he gave me a very good uh, kind of story. He said, you know, one day, an American tourist ended up at the uh, event horizon. And being American, of course, he's curious and he's scientific and all of that. He looks right down into the black hole, into the singularity, which is zero volume and infinite density. And he looks there and he says, you know, he says to whatever he sees there, he says, are you God? And the answer comes back, booming, yes, I am. <laughs> I've heard that on your side of the event horizon, um, even a dollar is, or even a penny is worth a billion dollars. Hmm. Is that true? And so the answer comes back from the singularity, yes, that's true. So the tourist being American, he says, uh, in that case, can I have a penny? And uh, the booming voice says, sure, can you wait a second? <laughs> okay. So a second there, or even a microsecond there, <laughs> on the other side. Okay, so that's one joke. The other actually, uh, I actually had the privilege of uh, being invited to uh, Stephen Hawking's birthday party <laughs> in uh, New York at the Lincoln Center and I got invited because uh, because uh, my other co-author you know I've authored a book with uh, Leonard Malard now who has co-authored many books with Stephen Hawking in fact Leonard and I are doing an interview soon on the life of Stephen Hawking because he actually wrote all of Stephen Hawking's books. Mm. So I was invited to this birthday party at the Lincoln Center and they actually flew in Stephen Hawking on his wheelchair with his computer and everything to the event. And before the event, they had a ballet and a ballet performance with ballet dancers all from the Lincoln Center, beautiful music, uh, classical music, etc. And the play was called Icarus as you know about Icarus, the, the kid who tried to fly to the sun. And got burned. And got burned. 
So this play was called Icarus. And in the play, it's all done ballet with classical music. It's beautiful, actually, all these people dancing. But there's a big, big starship uh, that's going to another galaxy. And uh, the starship is bigger than the biggest uh, ship you can imagine. You know, it's like huge. And it can accommodate several generations of humans because they're going to another galaxy. Okay, and the captain of the ship has a son who's only 12, 12 years old, and the son's name is Icarus. And, you know, uh, the captain says to his son, he says, you know, we're going to be going past lots of black holes as we go to other galaxies. And my dear son, I don't want you to mess with a glass black hole, because if you do, I'll never see you again. Okay, so promise me, you'll never mess with a black hole. So of course, you know, kids are kids. So after all, everybody is asleep. And 12 year old Icarus goes to the computer room in the ship, the starship. And he starts playing with his computer, looking for black holes. He finally identifies one. And he says to himself, what the heck? You know, I'm gonna go and look. Look for it. So he types out the digits, the codes. He gets into you know the porthole of the starship. There are little boats, little boats, just like ships have little boats. He has his little uh, speedboat that can navigate space. He types in the computer digits, and off he goes. And he skirts a black hole. He finds a uh, event horizon and he actually gets to the edge of it. And he's kind of either way he could topple over. You know, he's in the gravitational field that he could go this way or he could go that way. And he's very skillful. He's a good navigator. So he, he goes around the black hole once um, in his um, um, little boat and he doesn't topple over nor does he get on this side. He manages to skirt the black hole. And then with great effort, he gets out of the gravitational field. And now he's back into interstellar space. And he radios his dad. He says, dad, I did it. <laughs> There's no response. He says, dad, I did it. No response. Dad, I did it. No response. He goes into panic. Okay, there's no response to any radio signal he gives. So he lets the little ship drift off into interstellar space. And then suddenly he hears a radio signal. And he knows that he's in another galaxy, in another planet. Quickly types in his uh, digital codes, lands in this uh, on this planet in another galaxy. A lot of people come out and they're looking at him and they're looking at his um, little spaceship. He said, where did you come from? And, you know, Icarus says, I came from a, a, a place called planet Earth in another galaxy. And those um, people on this planet said, very interesting because, you know, that, that model, that spaceship you came in, that went out of design a few billion years ago. <laughs> oh my gosh. What had happened is in that one little round, he had, he had traveled a few billion years into the future. It's a story, but it was a beautiful play. I've never seen it again. I've never seen it, but it was a tribute to Stephen Hawking. Um, so, that's, uh, I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, thank you, Deepak. That was such a beautiful story. I was trying to track, actually. I was like, wait, is he still talking about Stephen Hawking's birthday? Because I was trying to put that together with everything else. And I was like, wow, that is a really incredible story that explains space time and black holes. And it's just pretty mind blowing when you put your head around that. And I don't know if uh, Don will agree to this. They're all constructions in consciousness, 
No, I, I, I absolutely agree. And so as a scientist, what I want to do is understand precisely how we make the construction. Then okay. we can play with it. <laughs> You know, it's so funny that I just got done is that the construction is like the ship. We're all like the little boy who wants to go explore the vastness of space and get as far to the edge as we can without getting engulfed by the black hole. And yet in doing so, the ship that he's traveling in is consciousness because it's the construction. Yes, yes. And, and there's also this very interesting question about how similar is your construction to mine? Mm. Right. I, we, we're all using terms as though we mean exactly the same thing, space and time and the color red and the roundness of an orange and so forth. But if I could get inside your head and experience what you're experiencing, would I be surprised? Would I say, wow, we both called that a, an orange and we both called it a navel orange, but boy, what I'm experiencing is utterly different from what you're experiencing. We, we do know in the case of synesthesia, that there are people, about 4% of, of human beings have various kinds of synesthesia where they perceive things very, very differently from the rest of us. But is it possible that synesthesia goes much deeper than we ever imagined? Is it possible that we're only sharing words, but we never share experiences? Is that possible? Is your, we all, it's, it's, it's a really interesting open question. And I don't know if we could ever get empirical data to settle the, the question, which is even more disturbing, that there might not be any experiment we could do to ever answer the question I'm raising, it, which is, could it be that all of your experiences are utterly unlike anybody else's experiences? And that's true for all of us. Is that, is that possible? And we all, even because we share words, we have the illusion that we're sharing the same world of experience. That's such an important point right now, that if every experience is a construct, how do we know what the other person is experiencing? In fact, each of us has a unique universe. And not only each of us, maybe every sentient being has a unique universe. We don't know. So I would like to suggest, actually, because Don is such an expert in synesthesia and visual perception also, that we devote an entire uh, session to the implications of synesthesia and multiple realities, because the conversation is going there even in science today, multiple universes, multiple uh, uh, worlds. Um, maybe they're all uh, even more multiple than we think they are, <laughs> uh, because they are constructs in consciousness. I would love to do that. And if we do that, I'll propose a specific virtual reality technology that we might want to explore. Wonderful. Why don't Wonderful. We do that next time. Um, yeah. May I suggest a title for today's talk, if you like it? So I was thinking, um, um, calling it uh, Constructing the Past and Future of the Universe Now. Constructing the Past and Future of the Universe Now. Very cool. And navigating time travel and navigating time travel. That's kind of, it's a juicy invitation for people. You're to testing my memorization abilities, Deepak. Constructing the past and future now and navigating time travel? Let's say, and time travel, and okay. time travel. So if Don likes it. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's great. I love it, Gat. I love it. Thank you so much, Deepak and Don. This was such a fascinating, I loved your example of the story too, Deepak of Icarus. That was such a beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Jennifer. Both. A fun question. Yeah, a lot of fun. Thanks. All Bye. right. Wishing everybody a great rest of your week. Be well. Bye. Take care. You too. <laughs>